So we've got a short video coming up, um, which we'll play in a second. But I thought we might just go straight into scripture tonight. Nehemiah chapter 1. And the message of this, this the, the title of this message tonight is this. Developing a burden for God's plans. Developing a burden for God's plans. Over the last two, three weeks, we have been looking, especially in prayer meeting as well, we have just been sort of drawing out a scripture, you know, what God's plans are. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at um, revival. And I just want to encourage you guys tonight just to sort of go with us on this because I believe that God really wants to take us to the next level as his church. We have been looking at, uh, I want to give you the, 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 sort of the, 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 the sort of nuts and bolts of the last couple of messages, but the first one we looked at was the, the issues of prayer and uh, prisons. Do you remember that? How Peter gets out of the prison because of prayer. And then last week we looked at how Peter walked on water, but it was a result of what Jesus was doing. We often look at the amazing great characters in the Bible. But what happened is, is that before that, Jesus goes up into a mountainside to pray, to offload a lot of stuff, get before Heavenly Father, and, and really do some business. And tonight what I want to do is, I want to further that thinking, and we're going to look at prayer and, God, it's a bit squeaky, isn't it? prayer and vision. Prayer and vision go hand in hand. Amen? If you want to see vision come about in God's house, God's kingdom, we need to get into prayer to find the heart of God and what he wants. What we don't want to be doing as a church is going off track, here, there and everywhere. We need to get it right first time. Otherwise, what happens is we end up wasting a lot of time, you know, getting back on track again. Let's get it right first time. So here we go. We're going to look at a man who prayed and we know the outcome. If you know your Bible, if you know the book of Nehemiah, if you don't, it's a great read. It's often... The, the, it's known as the, the preacher's building program, yeah? If you want to build something in church, okay, you go right into the book of Nehemiah. If you want to do a, an extension on your church, then Nehemiah is your man. Is that right, Phil? Yes. It's true, isn't it? Every time I've been part of a building program, it's Nehemiah gets raised up, okay? But I want to go back right to the roots of where Nehemiah came from before he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And we're going to unpack one or two things for us. Here we go. Verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citizen, citadel of Susa. You know, it, you, you, it makes you wonder if... Um, if, if, if some of these guys were having a laugh with some of these names, you know, I'll just kill it, call my kids, you know, has, has, has a, whatever it is, yeah. So, Hannah and I, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins where we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. I want to say a few weeks back we were in the prayer meeting and I said we need to start repenting. If we want to see revival, we need to start and continue to repent 
for the things that has been done by the generations around us and perhaps even the past and things that may have happened in this church or even surrounding churches. We need to repent. We need to get before God. And there's our scriptural precedence for that. Now, where was I? Okay. Um, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as my dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. All right, so we have Nehemiah who's been carried off into exile and out of exile, he hears one or two things coming back from family members about what's happened in Jerusalem. They're in great trouble and great distress. And so out of that, what happens if you've got Nehemiah, who is actually already elevated, in a sense, to your know, right-hand man of, of the king, cupbearer. He would bring that, he would check it out, you know, is, it, is it poison and so forth. And that was his job. So in a sense, he had to go be to, before the king whenever the king required uh, for that particular task. Now, the Jews have been exiled, they've been taken into this foreign land, and the home city of Jerusalem has been raided time and time again and left to ruin. The Jews, because of their disobedience, have been exiled in that country. But some of them have made their way back to Jerusalem, the capital city. In some small measure, it's often like us when we reject God, we backslide. And so what happens? We say, you God, I don't want any more. I don't want to go any further or any deeper in you. I want to back off and I just want, I don't want any more of this. And God's saying, as he said to them, if you want to go off in that direction, then go ahead. It's your choice, but I won't stop you. I love you, but I won't stop you. The wall has been broken down and it has no gates back in Jerusalem. Nehemiah gets the full story. And as as we know, Nehemiah eventually goes back and what he does is he he fixes the gates on and he starts to rebuild the, the, the walls of Jerusalem. I want to suggest this. It's not necessarily a message about backsliding this morning or this evening rather, but Can I just suggest, if that's your position, unless you come back to your senses, your God, okay, uh, and begin to uh, get back on track with your relationship with God, then you are like the wall of Jerusalem. What happens is, it is torn down, your life is torn down, you are defenseless against the enemy. Armies, wild animals can walk straight into your life and walk straight out again. And we wonder why our lives are sometimes all over the place. We wonder why our lives are in disarray when our walls are being torn down. Back in the day, no, we don't have, you know, the scenario of where we have to protect Edinburgh Castle any longer, all right? If you've ever been to Edinburgh, the walls around it are magnificent. You can actually walk through inside the walls, I'm told by my brother-in-law, who used to guard it as, as a royal engineer. But the fact is, back in the day, when your walls were torn down, you were defenseless. Anybody and anything could walk in and take what they wanted. So what we need to do is, what you need to do, is you need to do a rebuilding program to repair your walls. Let me encourage you that when you're in God, you're under construction. It's good, isn't it? You are under construction. God has got a plan for your life. And you might feel a bit vulnerable here, there and everywhere. 
but you are loved by God and you are under construction. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, hey, guess what? God loves you and you're a man or a woman under construction. Come on, tell your neighbor. Come on. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> There are things in this world that are not right, as we know, all right? But the question is, are we desensitized to them or are we burdened for change? I believe that God wants to give you and I and this church a bigger picture of his plans. I often talk about kingdom thinking, yeah? I believe we need to have kingdom thinking, not Alan thinking, not Matt thinking, not, you know, James thinking, kingdom thinking. We need to get where God is. Why? Because kingdom thinking takes us of our situations to see how God sees them. All right, we're going to watch a short clip. Good girl, Phoebe. Nice and calm today. Karen, Karen, I've got a cat with no pulse here. I need adrenaline and an IV line. Quick as you can, please. See you tomorrow, then. Should have gone to Specsavers, eh? Isn't it amazing if you've got the right equipment, you're doing the right thing, okay? You might be wanting the right uh, ending to your story, but if you have not got the right equipment, okay, you can completely miss the vision that God has for your life. Not true? Yeah. And so tonight we're going to look at a man who prayed his way into vision. Okay? If you want to see a bigger vision for your life, if you want to see your life straightened out, if you want to see God do much more in your ministry, whatever the need is, and if we want to see corporately as a church, God move in this place, we need to get a bigger vision and we need to get our specs on the right way. Amen? All right. P.K. Bernard says this, A man without a vision is a man without a future. A man without a future will always return to his past. I want to tell you, I can confirm that, I can clarify, I can say that is absolutely true firsthand because I have been there. When I have no vision for my life, when I have tried to do things my way, I always return to old me. Never a good idea because God wants something fresh for our lives. Today, God wants something fresh for your life today. And so we are going to look deeper. Now, Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no, re you know this one, where there is no revelation, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. If you actually look at one translation of that, you know it says where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Now, what that means is when we cast off restraint and we start to untether ourselves from God and his plans, then it says here that people perish. They cast off restraint. By casting off restraint means that anything goes in our lives. It means that we allow you know, ourselves to go off for a wander because we've got nothing fixed in our lives to anchor us to God's will. Does that make sense, church? Yeah? So we don't want to be casting off restraint. We want to be getting God's vision for our hearts and our lives. Your vision must take place in the spiritual before it can outwork in the natural. God says something and then he, what he says goes into the natural. He speaks life over your lives. Let's put it this way. God has already got it planned out for you but unless you open up your life to him and allow him to work then the architect plans are useless they will just sit on the shelf gathering dust they become what could have been what would have been and what should have been plans if we just sit on the fence and do nothing but what god is calling us to do so the question is do you want more for your life do you 
Do you want more for your life? Then you've got to get with what Nehemiah was doing and he got before God. So if so, let's learn something from the man, okay? How do we develop a burden for God's plans? How do we develop that burden? I believe in, in that first chapter, there are actually some keys, some very specifics that we need to do. And some of them are very practical. Let's look at it. So, the first thing we need to do is we need to have in ministry, okay, we need in ministry something that illuminates God's heart and vision for us. All right, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some of the men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are still in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah very practically went on a fact-finding mission. In fact, even when he got to Jerusalem, the first thing he did was he went and took a look around to see what was actually happening on the ground. But in this here, he just went on a fact. He said, what's going on back in Jerusalem? What is happening? How are people hurting? I'm sure, you know, this has been simplified for us. I'm sure he didn't just say, well, okay then. All right, I heard what you said. They're having a bit of a half time and uh, they're struggling a bit and that's it. I'm sure he went into some more detail detail. At this point, he wasn't burdened for anything. He just wanted to ask some questions. Now, what we can say for certain was that he had a heart for his home city. Do we have a heart, and I've said this before, for our hometown, our home village, or is it just a heap of problems in our minds? Many of us consider doing stuff for God. But so often we drop those plans because things get in the way. Fear, relationships, all these things. Many, many things get in our way because we drop our plans for what God is wanting in our lives and we do what we want to do. You see, the thing is, what we don't want to be doing is, and and I've had enough of this. I did this in my earlier years of Christianity. I had a, a wishful thinking list. A wishful thinking list looks like stuff that I really wanted to do, but I never get around to doing it. Stuff that I wanted to do that I felt God was saying do it, but I turned my back on God. Anybody else been in their own wishful thinking list? Had that kind of uh, approach to life? I suggest what you want to do is you want to grow, you want to see vision in your life, you need to action some of those things that God is calling you to do. Bob Logan says this about vision. He says, a godly vision is right for the times. It's right for the church and it's right for the people. A godly vision promotes faith rather than fear. A godly vision motivates people to action. A godly vision requires risk-taking. A godly vision glorifies God not people. Nehemiah is off the starting block. He's asked some questions and he begins to see that something needs to be done in society. And as a result, he begins to get a burden for home. The beginning is just a little spark. He's beginning to see that something has to be done. You know, prayer, burdens and vision, they go hand in hand every time. Prayer, burdens, and vision. Having a burden is just another word for saying you're pregnant. Matthew 11 said this, I quoted it earlier on. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, that's a burden. Do you remember, we started off tonight, we talked about, you're free at last. Free at last. So when we are free at last, we are free from the burdens that we carry in life. Are you with me, church? 
When we are free and what you know, uh, when we're free and we are ready to do God's will, then we unburden ourselves. We give those burdens to God. But listen to what Jesus said. He says, "Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." Now that is amazing, that's incredible, that gives me inspiration, that gives me hope, that gives me joy in my life because the first version of that, those burdens that we carry about which God never designed us to carry, those are the things which actually allow the walls in our lives to be broken down and the enemy gets straight in. But when we carry the burdens, the light burden of Jesus, then... We are built up in him. Then we come under his protection. Then we come under his love and his amazing grace. Amen? All right. So, vision gives you hope to carry out the work that God gives us to do. Because if we try and do life in our own strength, then we carry a heavy burden that we were never designed to carry. But Jesus asks us to carry a burden that's light. Let me just explain that. What is Jesus' burden for you and me and this church? Jesus' burden is this, that his vision, his plans are easy to carry. They're not heavy. They're not troublesome for our lives. They are something that we do with joy and love and and thanksgiving because we know we are in the will of God. There's a big difference. If I try and do somebody else's job in ministry, it's heavy work. It's hard work. Have you ever tried to do somebody else's job? No. Yeah? Harold, you're a blessed man. That's all I can say. You're a blessed man. I have done many people's jobs because I've had to do it in ministry. But when I am doing what God has called and gifted me to do, then the burden is light. That is why the body of Christ must work together and do their own part. Because Jesus' burden is light. But when I carry something else that I wasn't designed to carry, that's hard work. That's so hard work. Anyway, moving on. All right. So the first part is this. We must, okay, uh, have the ministry, the needed ministry, illuminate God's heart and vision. The second thing about Nehemiah is he discovered that vision is always birthed in prayer. All right? If you want to get the vision part, you need to get back to the beginning. You need to get grounded in what God wants to say. Someone once said this, he who loves much prays much. It's true. That goes for any area of life. If you love something enough, more than anything, you will pray for it. You will unleash, okay, prayer into a situation. You will unleash prayer into a family member. You will unleash prayer into your ministry. You will unleash prayer for your brother and sister. You will unleash prayer for your next door unsaved neighbor. You will unleash prayer if you love much. That's how you know where your heart is, whether it's true or not, in love. Because if you're not full of love, you will not pray into something that will cause change. Does that make sense, church? All right. Okay. Verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said... O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I like how the fact he just didn't jump to conclusions. I like the fact that he didn't jump to presumption. He waited, he prayed, he fasted, he got before God, then he addressed the situation with God. God, what do you want to do about it? 
You've heard me. My heart is getting a burden for what's going on around me and obviously over in Jerusalem. God, my heart is burdened because something somewhere is wrong. I've tried to start things in the past on a wing and a prayer. <laughs> I have. I've tried to start some stuff and just hoping that God would show up. You give God a moment of your time and think that because you prayed something that God will bless it. If I were to think of my most precious possession, I have to ask the question, would I be willing to part with it and give it to you? So it is with God. In the parable of the talents, yeah, God gives, or the master gives the three servants, servants three amounts of money according to their ability and according to how much he trusts them. You see, it was thought out. It was considered. What God, how much do you want to impart to us? You see, we need to spend time before God, seeking his heart, finding out what he wants for every situation of life. Prayer is what happens before you have a vision and doesn't stop until after the baby is born, if ever. If ever. Try putting it like this. Prayer is the umbilical cord. Okay, you guys listen to this. Okay. Prayer is the umbilical cord which keeps the baby alive in the womb. Do you hear that, church? It's like that with vision. Prayer is the umbilical cord that keeps the vision alive while it is developing. While it is growing. While the burden is there. Prayer is the thing that infuses, that keeps it going, that keeps it fed. Keeps it fed. All right. If you remove the umbilical cord prematurely, then the baby will not get all its needs and possibly die. If it does survive, then it will likely need a lot of medical attention. I have seen ministries born and you put so much into them because they were, no, they were born prematurely. They were never right to be born at that time. Not that they weren't right to be born at all, but just at that time. And so what happened is the thing has been born prematurely and it spent a lot of time giving the thing medication. <laughs> Throwing money at stuff, you know, and, and it goes all wrong. This is why we have to see things brought through to full term. All right, where are we? Habakkuk 2 says this, listen to the whole of this. We often look at the, the beginning of it, but listen to this. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation or the vision and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits the appointed time. See, sometimes we get a revelation, we've got to do it now. Yeah, we've got to do it now. It's got to be right when we want it to be ready. And that's not what it's saying here. It says, the revelation, the vision waits the appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. But here's the key to it. The fact is that Nehemiah got before God and prayed and burdened himself with this thing. And eventually, there was outcome from that when God said it was the right time. Okay, moving on. Final, uh, final point is this. Number three. Favour is the confirmation of vision. If you take notes, favour is the confirmation of vision. Verse 11. O Lord, after he's prayed, by the way, after he's considered, after he's prayed, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man, the king. I was cupbearer to the king. See, favour is getting the green light from God on a matter, isn't it? Have you ever had God's favour on your life? It's amazing. 
When God opens up something and you just know that God's in it, that God is, is delighted in what you have done, in what you are doing, and, and he just, everything just falls right into place. Amen? If you've never had that experience, get before God and start praying. Get before God and start listening. Get before God and start getting burdened. Because I tell you what, when God unleashes his plans on your life, it all falls into place and you just know everything becomes easy. How do you know it's not God? Well, everything's a real grind. Life is just full of trouble. Life is full of problems. And even then, when we do come up against tough times, we flow through those things because the Spirit of God is upon us at the time. If you're going through a hard time, ask yourself this. Am I in the will of God? Am I doing what God would want me to do? I'm not saying it may be a time of trial and testing. There's a difference there. But I'm just saying, if everything's a real grind, just stop for a second and say, hang on a minute, have I got this wrong? Just a thought. Anyway, moving on. Where are we? So, favour is getting the green light from God. So, often we want to jump to the blessing part without going through the planning of the pregnancy. Too many people try to do God's will in their own strength, but when God establishes a vision, you cannot stop him. You just can't. I once heard it put it like this. You have been given an all-access pass. The pass won't work for somebody else in your situation because they have to get their own pass. What is favour? It's when God opens doors that nobody can shut. Nobody can shut. You know the story, my, the basic story of how we ended up here, but I'm going to give you the scripture of how we ended up. God gave us a scripture, and it was back in the year 1999. I can remember where I was. I can remember when I was. It was lunchtime. I was at work. I used to go outside, and I used to sit in front of a field at lunchtime, eat my sandwiches and whatever I had at the time, and a bit of cake and whatever. And I sat there, and over the year, I used to see that the farmer come in, and he would harvest, and then he would uh, you know, let it lie in the ground for a bit, and then he would dig it up and do a bit of ploughing up and all the rest of it, and then it would grow, and he would plant stuff, and it would begin to grow and sprout and all the rest of it and it would grow right up and I saw this going over the whole year and one time I sat out there saying God what do you want for my life and I was praying every day I was reading my Bible just at lunchtime and God gave me the script from Revelation 3 it says this to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these are the words of him who is holy and true who holds the key of David where he opens no one can shut and it struck me for the first time in my life of reading Revelation, many times in my life, it really hit home because God was saying, look, you follow me and I'm on your side. I'm going to open up stuff for you in your life that's just going to blow your mind. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. There's lots of keys to success in there. Lots of keys. Not just simply God saying he's going to open up a door. It's the fact that when we follow God's heart, when we do what he does, he knows our deeds. He responds to righteousness. He responds to prayer. He responds to faith. He responds to your heart. He responds to love. He responds. It's good, isn't it? Come on, somebody look convinced at least. He responds when we are right before him and he opens doors. So what is God waiting for? We're going to close. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. He is waiting for someone who will step up and be a man, a woman of vision, who sees things from his perspective. I want to encourage you, church, while your heads are bowed, are you willing to see it from his perspective? Church, 
Are you ready? Are you willing to say, God, I want to just question where you have put me. God, I want to step into this. I want to trust you and I'm going to pray this thing through. And then, Father God, if you're in it, you will grant favor. Much favor. Bags of favor. Heaps of favor. What are you waiting for tonight? What are you waiting for? What is, what are you, where, where are you in your life? Are you wanting to, in faith, trust him? Are you willing to get before him and pray? Are you willing to get before us at the, in the prayer meeting, with us at the prayer meeting, so that we can pray through, pray through some of this stuff, so we can pray for vision? Are you willing to put yourself out to develop a burden for God's plans. What are you waiting for tonight? One thing we're going to do as a church is time. I've never said this in my front, okay? Uh, in the sense of a formal way, but we need to start praying and fasting. We need to, I, I'm sure many of you fast already, okay? But formally, I'm going to say this. In February of this year, or next year, we're going to have a month of prayer and fast. We're going to get before Father God. But in the meantime, from next month, from December, we're going to set aside a, month, a Monday to pray and fast as a church. Every Monday, where possible. Now, that may well be, church, that might just be a partial fast. That may be a full fast. You know your situation, you know your own bodies, you know where you're at health-wise, so let's consider that. But the point being, it's time to get before God and pray and fast. It's biblical. And we're going to do it intentionally as a church. But tonight, where are you at? Are you seeking the heart of God? Do you have a burden for what God is calling you to do? Do you have a burden for the things of God? Father, tonight, I pray that, Father, that you would grow in us and you would deepen us, Father God, in your plans. But, Father God, Father, you want to see us get real with you, Father. I pray that tonight, that, Father, that you would... Uh, stir us up, Father God, each one of us in our hearts. And I pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord God, that we would see a burden grow for your plans, for the lost, for your vision, Father God. I pray that each one of us, Father, we would see a glimpse of your glory. And Father God, Lord, we want to see the blessing out of this. Of course we do, Father God. But it's all about you, Father. So I pray that tonight, the Lord, that you would capture our hearts, capture our minds, capture our spirits tonight. Lord, I pray that you would just captivate us. Lord, and I pray that, Father, as we step in and we go deeper in you, Father, that you might be, eh, Lord God, glorified. But, Father God, we just want to give you our hearts. We just want to give you ourselves. Lord God, we desire to see what you want to do here. We want to be a part of that. But Father God, it's going to take us to get before you. So Lord God, would you give us the strength and the courage to step up and step out for you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. The prayer meeting is on Wednesday, okay? Leader's prayer is on tomorrow. If you can't make that, then why don't you put something on WhatsApp and say, God is saying this, and God, you know, we've got a Facebook, a, a WhatsApp group out there. You know, some, I know some of you guys can't make it, but, yep, yeah, we'll do. And, um, but can I just encourage you to start praying with us? Praying with us. You might, you might not find the time at some times, but can I just encourage you, start praying. Just ask God in your own time if you can't make the prayer meeting. But God wants to do something amazing. God wants to, to grow us as a fellowship. You know, we can only grow so much, we can always grow spiritually, but God wants to grow us numerically, and I have to say that unashamedly. 
God wants to add numbers to his fellowship. God wants to grow us, but God wants to use you to do that and me. Amen.